In this episode of Behind the Headlines, a $350 million sale in Ottawa's commercial real estate sector, legal tips before you buy an income property, and our newsmaker of the week. All this coming up right now. Behind the Headlines is brought to you by Nelligan Law, Ottawa's fierce, proven, and human law firm, Visit them at nelliganlaw.ca. Hello and welcome to Behind the Headlines. It's December 8th, 2021. I'm Michael Curran from the Ottawa Business Journal. Behind the Headlines is a regular podcast from the Ottawa Business Journal to explore the biggest local business news headlines. Uh, as always, we're going to have three segments today. We're going to have, have David Solly uh, coming up to dig into the big local business news headline. We're going to hear from our legal experts at Nelligan Law, and finally end up with our newsmaker of the week. Let's go to segment number one right now. Uh, hello, David Solly. Hey, Mike. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Good. I think this is a fascinating uh, story, Dave. So uh, let's just zoom out before you zoom us in on this $350 million deal. So we have a pandemic. Uh, we have uh, the effectively the downtown core, our business center of Ottawa, empty out of all those white collar workers, both in the private sector and the public sector. Yep. Notably, we also have a public sector that has really no plans to return to the workplace. And all of this is, of course, causing massive economic dam damage. So if you're a, uh, a bookkeeper, if you're a hairdresser, if you're a, a shop owner downtown, if you're a restaurant, I mean, you your business has literally dried up. Um, so amidst all this context, Dave, we have the second largest commercial real estate transaction in Ottawa history. Tell us more. Right, Mike. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you, you might, and at first glance, you might think, uh, wow, what, what a time to, to have a deal like this. But it happened uh, just recently. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the sale closed the Plasteville office complex, which everyone is familiar with. Of course, it's got the tallest office building in Ottawa. That's, um, you know, uh, on uh, Queen and uh, and Spark Streets there. Um, uh, it's a, um, it, it's a multiple, multiple building, a, a four building complex, actually. Um, and uh, it uh, it sold recently, so it was bought by Crest Point Real Estate Investments and Crown Realty Partners. They are both from Toronto, um, and they uh, and um, and they purchased it for three hundred and fifty million dollars. Mike, as you mentioned, it was uh, this is the second largest deal uh, in Ottawa real estate history. Um, only Constitution Square, which uh, sold back in twenty seventeen for. 480 million. Uh, uh, that's the only deal that, that surpasses the, this one in terms of total value. Um, so the sellers were the Alberta Investment Management Corporation, Brookfield Properties, and the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. Uh, they had jointly owned the building before. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, uh, it, it's a it's a really interesting uh, deal, Mike, because you uh I mean, uh, deals of these magnitude, uh, they don't happen very often. Um, and uh, especially in a climate like this, uh, you would expect that they, they're even less likely to happen. But, um, but in fact, I talked to Crown Realty partner Emily Hanna last week, and she, um, you know, she called Plastaville a best-in-class uh, office property. Um, you know, she says it's still in great shape. You know, it's, you know it was built almost 50 years ago. Uh, it's, you know, it's got floor plates that can accommodate a wide range of tenants. Uh, obviously, it's location. It's uh, it's connected to the uh, Lion LRT station, one of only a handful of properties uh, in Ottawa that actually is directly con connected to an LRT station. But probably the biggest thing, Mike, who is its main tenant? The federal government uh, occupies about 85% of the property. Um, Canada Revenue Agency, Transport Canada, the main tenants, still got over five years left on their lease. And even though we don't know exactly what the federal government's long-term plans are going to be in terms of the return to work policy, you have to figure um, it's still going to occupy a huge footprint downtown and Plastaville is likely going to be in that mix, especially considering the building's still in really good shape. Um, so uh, that's a real attractive proposition for a prospective buyer. When you know you're 
you're, you've got a tenant in there that's uh, that's that's going to pay the rent every month and uh, isn't going anywhere. It's a it's a great steady income stream, and uh, that's what um, what they really like about it. Um, and it's uh, you, you, know, you know it's just one of those. Um, it certainly is an eyebrow uh, raiser, um, but clearly, um, I, I, um, it seems like uh, the Canada Pension Plan um, uh, CPP investments, for instance. The, um, Maybe they're they're kind of divesting some of their downtown uh, holdings. They were also uh, a significant uh, owned a significant stake in Constitution Square. Um, so uh, and uh, when it came on the market in June, there were all kinds of potential suitors, as you would expect. Um, I talked to Nico Zentel from CPRE's Ottawa office, who helped broker the deal along with RBC Capital Markets, and uh, he said, you know, as soon as it went on the market. Um, uh, he was getting um, strong interest from a bunch of, as he called them, high quality bidders. Um, and, you know, just uh, again, he mentioned the cash flow security, uh, a great income stream there. Uh, and there is also a vacant parking lot um, uh, as part of the package as well, um, Mike. And that's, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Nico mentioned, that's a real prime uh, property for potential development. So, um, so you know, when you get four buildings like this, combine that with another, uh, uh, um, you know, p potential development opportunity, uh, it was a pretty attractive uh, prospect for um, uh, for for uh, Crown Realty and Crest Point. Yeah, I think what one just a bit more context, Dave. Just a few weeks ago, we were talking about an event called the Ottawa Real Estate Forum, and I think it was. PWGSC, I stand to be corrected, that was uh, speaking at the event and said it was likely the federal government might be shedding office space. So I think that still is the larger context that this deal happens in, but potentially this is the preferred space, right? So uh, it, yeah. if they're shedding space, it, it'll probably be space that is, uh, I wouldn't say class B, it, it might be less environmentally sound, it might be less desirable, yeah. uh, but it seems... Um, uh, Plastaville still is kind of in that preferred category. That's probably giving them a lot more uh, peace of mind in signing that $350 million check. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, that's all the time we have uh, for our uh, first segment. Uh, it's now time to consult with our legal expert from Nelligan Law. This episode, I'm pleased to be welcoming once again, Brian Thaw, a lawyer with Nelligan Law. He is a member of the firm's real estate and development practice group. Welcome back, Brian. Thanks for having me again, Michael. So this is the uh, second of the two-parter we're doing, but we're talking about the same uh, topic. We're talking about income properties, again, uh, properties that uh, someone has purchased uh, with a desire of generating some income. So that can be residential or that could be commercial. Uh, the last time we talked, uh, several days ago, Brian, we talked about uh, you know, some really good legal tips. One that stood out to me was considering whether you should incorporate to limit your personal liability. I like that one. And of course, uh, considering a proper lease, especially if it's commercial property, you know, those can be very complicated. You have some more uh, advice for us today. So uh, let's hear uh, let's hear today's advice. Yeah, I, I think a good starting point is I'm starting to see more and more cases where uh, individuals are buying properties that have open building permits, which are essentially uh, when you go to uh, make a major renovation or build uh, a property, uh, you go to the municipality to get a permit to permit you to start that construction. And before it's closed, an inspector needs to sign off on that. And what we're seeing now is those permits aren't getting signed off on and they're getting forgotten and the buyers will still move forward with closing and then they're on the hook for closing those permits and all the associated costs. Okay, wow, I I haven't heard of that one. That's that's really uh that's really interesting. I'm glad you're you're mentioning that to people. And you know, maybe we can talk zoning a little bit too. So you should be aware if it, whether it's a buying a commercial or residential property that there are zoning restrictions on land, right? On properties. Absolutely. Uh, especially in a commercial context, if you're buying a property with a intended use in mind, uh, it's important to consult with a lawyer to see what the zoning bylaw says in terms of, is that property zoned for your, uh, your future use? 
So if it's currently zoned as a dental office and you want to put a brewery in, then it's important that you consult with your lawyer to ensure that that use is permitted in that building. And if you don't, by the way, that's going to become an expensive and complicated thing with the city to, you know, the, the rezoning process, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I wanted to finish off uh, talking a little bit about cottages. So uh, that might uh, on a, on when people are hearing that, why is a cottage? Oh, that's right. People are buying cottages these days. They're like, there's a voracious demand for cottages. And part of the rationale often because cottages cost so much is, Hey, uh, we're going to rent it out some of the time to help cover the cost of acquiring and maintaining this property. So if, uh, if someone's purchasing a cottage and wants it to be an income property, what should they be thinking about Brian? Yeah, I think there are a multitude of, of areas you should look into, but you know, top of mind, uh, the first one would be, is the, is it on municipal services? So is it on uh, municipal water? Is it on sewer? Is it on, uh, hydro, uh, in the cases where it's not on municipal services, then I always tell my clients to, uh, go and get a water potability test in the case of the drinking water to make sure that it is drinkable water, especially if you want to rent it out, uh, in the case of septic, septic, uh, you want to make sure that you go and, uh, reach out to the ministry to see that the permits are there and that it was installed properly. And also you want to make sure that you have legal access to the to the cottage itself uh you know a lot of these properties are are landlocked and are only accessible by water or uh, a private right of way so speaking with your lawyer to make sure that you have legal access is always advisable good well brian thank you so much for joining us again today i think uh the underlying theme here is if you're going to buy an investment property you really need to talk to a lawyer and why not talk to brian right here thanks brian thanks a lot michael hope to see you soon all right uh it's great to hear from brian from nelligan once again with us appreciate the ongoing support of nelligan law uh before we go to this week's newsmaker uh we want to talk for a second about the environment it's a it's an issue that's top of mind uh, obviously uh, cop 21 just uh finished up in scotland so we all have these thoughts of how we can do a better job personally uh, and in our businesses uh, on the environment. So I want to give a shout out to a local organization that's doing some really good work. It was founded way back in 1999. The name of it is the Enviro Center, and it's an organization that's helping residents, businesses, and organizations of all sorts conserve energy, reduce their impact in the environment, uh, all at the same time with saving money. So those are three great things uh, that we should all be interested in. The Enviro Center is sponsoring the next few episodes of Behind the Headlines. And here is its video message right now. Our actions shape our world and our climate. Sometimes it can be hard to know where we fit into the bigger picture. What exactly do we need to do to address climate change? That's where Enviro Center's My Green Lifestyle courses come in. Whether it's how to reduce your carbon footprint or how to help your city and community meet its climate targets. A green lifestyle is about more than just living lightly. It's about building a better future. Visit our website today to enroll in our courses at mygreenlifestyle.ca. Thanks to our friends at the Enviro Center. We have a great newsmaker lined up for this week. We discussed in our first segment with David Sally, Ottawa's downtown core faces many challenges. The pandemic has emptied the core for most uh, white collar workers. Also federal government public servants are in a work from home status and we're not sure when they will return. All of this means an empty downtown court and great economic harm for local businesses down there. Our newsmaker is a leading urban advocate and civil society trailblazer. She's a frequent commentator on national and international city building programs. She works as the president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. Please welcome Mary Rowe. Good morning, Mary. Hi, good morning, Michael. How are you? Great, great. Uh, bring us up to speed. I mean, as you just heard in the uh, build up, I know Ottawa's downtown core is suffering greatly because it's it's mm -hmm. essentially empty these days. But mm -hmm. zoom out for us a little bit and tell us what's happened to downtown cores in the pandemic. You know, this is I mean, Ottawa is a particular situation and I'm I'm very pleased to be in Ottawa speaking to the chamber uh, about this, because I think that you have your own set of particular challenges, which are unique to Ottawa. But what is com what is common, I would say, across Canadian metros, and it's certainly true in the United States as well, is that because most people are working, not most, because a, a significant um, 
a percentage of people that work in offices who work in um, commercial engagement of some kind are able to work from home and they haven't been coming into the office. And that has had extraordinary impacts on the retail that exists and that is actually in service to a working population that come into the downtown core or what we used to call the central business district. So, um, so that's one particular set of challenges. The retail sector there has just been decimated through COVID. So the place where you used to take your dry cleaning or get a cup of coffee or get a sandwich at lunch or food courts and all the kinds of services that exist to support us in those kinds of concentrated work centers um, have been uh, really severely impacted. The other thing that happens in downtowns, of course, is cultural events, cultural institutions, recreational activity, um, tourists, business tourism, all those um, myriad of, acti of economic activity and social activity has been affected by the emptying of downtowns. Um, and the other thing is because we've had a shuttering of a lot of services that support vulnerable populations, people that are homeless or have mental health challenges, um, uh, that also now is concentrated in the downtowns uh, where some services may still exist. And so without having this, the kind of um, interactions that you normally have in busy downtowns with lots of comings and goings and backing and forth things, you're left with, as you've just described, and this is a, this is a scenario that we're seeing in Canadian downtowns, um, a, a fairly bleak kind of landscape. And uh, on the one hand, it's devastating and it's, uh, it's, it's pointing up for us the challenges that have been, that may have pre-existed in downtowns. Frankly, we didn't see them. Now you really see them. Uh, but it's also a moment to really uh, be thoughtful about what the future of downtowns could be and how should we be investing? What kinds of policies do we need to be putting in place to incentivize downtowns as they change, which cities are always changing and our downtowns are in the midst of an extraordinary change. Barry, you're in uh, Ottawa, as you uh, mentioned, on Tuesday, December 14th, and I'm mm -hmm. going to share some information about that event in, in just a second. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gathering, you know, a few hundred business people uh, to discuss this and think about this issue. I mm -hmm. guess, you know, what can be done about a situation like Ottawa's or more broadly uh, downtown cores? You know, the pandemic is at least the most recent cause of its uh, of, of their demise. So what should we be thinking? Can, do we have to sit back and passively wait for the pandemic to pass? Or can we be a bit more proactive about this? Well, first of all, we're not going to passively wait for nothing, right? I mean, uh, the pandemic could, pa is, the, is the pandemic going to pass, Mike? I mean, have you got a crystal ball here? Like we're, we're into a new era, I think, of understanding how we, how we can be more resilient to different kinds of risks. That may be a pandemic. It may be some kind of climate event. Um, there are all sorts of things that impinge on cities all the time. And the question is, how, how can we nimbly be responsive? So I think there are some really interesting ideas we could start to think about. We have to ask ourselves fundamentally, what's a downtown for? And if you think of why cities exist in the first place, they came together around an economy. People come into a congregate setting to exchange, barter, have some kind of transaction. That's what the city is. It's a place of transaction. And there are always going to be those kinds of transactions. So you could just as well ask yourself if NFTs are going to affect downtowns. There's all these things that are playing into how do we come together and what do we expect from our downtowns. So I would say a couple of things. The more diverse a neighborhood is, and let's look at downtown as a neighborhood. Like, like we look at every main street across. That's a big, big focus for us is for us to look at the granular and get down to your main street, the main street you live on, but also the main street you work on. What do you need in that main street? You need a mix of uses. You need a mix of users. And that's one of the disadvantages or one of the, the vulnerabilities of downtowns is that we tended to have downtowns dominated by people that were coming into work and then leaving, which meant you didn't really have a 24-7 feel in those communities. And I think that's a change we're going to see. We're going to see maybe there's an opportunity to um, put more housing into downtowns. Maybe some of those commercial buildings can be adapted in certain kinds of ways to accommodate some residential, to accommodate some cultural activities, to accommodate different kinds of businesses um, and enterprises because you've got these fantastic assets in these buildings. You don't want them to sit empty. And one thing we know is that when you have space that is empty, people will be imaginative about how to reuse that space. Artists, entrepreneurs, and some of what we may need to think about is does zoning need to change? Do our tax patterns need to change? And what do we collectively want to, to put back into downtowns to make them attractive and, and vibrant? And remember that a lot of people 
um, a lot of cities, and Ottawa is one of them, um, depend on tourists. You depend on people coming in for two days of meetings and then spending another two days going to the gallery. Or another, they come in, maybe they're going to come in and have a holiday. It's particularly true of places like uh, Ottawa that has a significant tourism base um, as the national, as the nation's capital. And you already have some really strong assets there in terms of recreational assets, cultural assets. And so it may be that you're going to start thinking about how do you invest in those differently and connect them into the downtown. You had already started to do some brave things around pedestrianizing areas. You've made this huge investment in the LRT. So I actually think Ottawa is very well positioned to um, come up with some imaginative repurposing of how we see downtowns. And it's going to take some courage and some risk taking and some really um, strong political consensus, which I know your mayor will, will want to lead around how do you actually um, reemerge in whatever the post-COVID world looks like. Um, into a kind of really new understanding and of what the potential of a downtown is. That's a that's a great preview of your keynote address coming up. And uh, I'll just share a bit more information at this point. So it's Tuesday, December 14th. It's happening at the Shaw Centre. Mm -hmm. It's a luncheon put on by the Ottawa Board of Trade and OBJ. Uh, it's going to start off around uh, 11, 1130. Uh, anyone who wants tickets uh, available uh, to the general public, uh, available at ottawabot.ca. And again, Mary's going to be our keynote. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Really appreciate it. What a great uh, preview of what we might hear on Tuesday. Well, and I want people to come with their ideas because one of the things that's important about our downtowns is that you nobody, it, it isn't owned by only one person or one sector, right? Downtowns yeah. are the heart of the city. We all own our downtown. So let's collectively start thinking imaginatively about what kind of investment and what kinds of public policy and how do we need industry to respond and how do we in the civil sector need to respond to make downtowns for everyone. I know, I know we hope this is the start of a discussion. So exactly. We're, we're using you as the spark. So I'm to happy to be a spark and, and let's have that conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Thanks very, thanks for okay, joining Mike. us. See you next week. That brings us to uh, the end of this episode. A reminder, this podcast can be watched uh, or listened to in various ways. Uh, we encourage people to watch us on YouTube. That's what most of you are probably doing. And if you are doing that, please give us a like, a follow and hit the bell icon and then you'll get notifications when we're live. You can also, if you prefer to listen to us, you can do so on Spotify, Apple, Google, SoundCloud, and any other popular uh, podcast platform. I encourage you hardcore local business uh, news uh, junkies to uh, visit us at obj.ca every day. It's updated regularly throughout the day with local news. And if you never want to miss a story, what you do is subscribe to OBJ today uh, thousands and thousands of local business leaders do this. OBJ. Uh, today is the uh, weekday, Monday to Friday, email newsletter that's sent out by OBJ. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, great to have you with us. And circle that date on the calendar. Maybe register for that event coming up on uh, December 14th. Uh, please uh, stay back. Come back and see us very soon. Uh, nice to see you. On behalf of all my colleagues at OBJ, I'm Michael Curran. Uh, please stay safe. Stay well. Bye-bye.